This is Kusha Karvandi, and you're listening to Exerscribe Radio. In today's episode, I interview Strength Camp's Elliot Hulse. Elliot Hulse has over a million YouTube subscribers and is the source on the internet for strength training. One of the things I really want to get to know is just kind of a little bit about you and how you got into the whole health and fitness game. Well, as far as getting into the fitness game, I I wouldn't even describe it that way. It's just who I've always been. It's where I come from. My parents are from Belize, and that's a country where you actually had no shoes, so you had to do the barefoot thing. We didn't. They didn't have vibrams back then. There was uh, there was bare feet because we don't have shoes, and there was uh, there was organic food because that's what the earth gave us. It wasn't. Uh, we didn't go to Walmart and go to the uh, to the green section where you buy. Um, organic food or anything like that. And back then, coconut oil is not only what you would eat, but you put it all over your skin and in your hair because there were so many goddamn coconuts that that's what they lived off of. So, you know, I come from an, a, a family and I come from an environment where all the things that we kind of uh, take for granted with regard to health and fitness was just a way of life. And I tend to think that's where human beings came from all of us and ultimately what we're striving towards with all of these scientific advances because for the most part it's just reiterating shit that we intuitively knew for generations you know we've lost our history in so many ways and i can get into all types of political rants about why that happened but now we're being sold back our history and um and it's in many ways it's kind of silly but anyway my parents came back came to the United States because, of course, that's what everybody wants to do, right? You know, it's the land of the the golden paved streets. At least that's what they thought. And uh, my dad got sick very quickly because, uh, you know, the golden paved streets also come with polluted air and denatured food, poor quality, and so on and so forth. And... They brought their little, my, my mother's little brother with them, and uh, they moved to, we, we first lived in Brooklyn, New York. And my uncle was a bit younger than my parents at the time. He was a martial artist, and he was a gymnast, and he was, uh, he ended up being a bodybuilder. He ran marathons. He was just a, a tremendous athlete in many regards. And when I, when, when I was a child, I remember my brother and I used to go down to the basement uh, where he would be training and he would show us how to do push-ups and sit-ups and climb rope and he would do backflips and chop bricks with his hands and uh, all these tremendous physical feats that most kids that went to school with me would hear about and they thought that I was either lying or that Superman lived with me and uh, it turned out that Superman actually lived with me because he, he was like a Superman in that way. He taught me how to train when I was very young. I, I My brother and I ended up getting college football scholarships because of our ability to grow stronger and faster, uh, not only because of good genetics, but also because we, we were training with barbells and, and, and doing you know, most of what athletes don't get to do until they're in college when we were in, in high school and middle school. So strength was, and fitness was my, was my passion. It's what allowed me to become what I was as an athlete. I also continued to study exercise physiology in college. And ultimately came out and decided to to start my own business, which had its own challenges. But uh, bottom line is, at some point, I decided to start recording my ideas and, and, and taking questions with regard to health and fitness and becoming the strongest version of yourself. At least that's what I call it through YouTube. And it's just taken off. Yeah, you, your your story reminds me a lot of uh, I think you know my uh, my friend Sean Croxton from Underground Wellness. He, uh, he told, yeah. me, told me to say hello. I was talking to him about uh, about how I was going to do this with you the other day, and he said he knew he knew you pretty well, and uh, highly recommended you. So similar story. Cool. He's though, great I like guy. that. Yeah, he's a good guy. So very cool. Yeah, you know, my parents uh, as well. They moved here from Iran back in the seventies. You know, looking for kind of the same thing that you're talking about. So I 100 percent agree that you know people come here with these expectations that. You know, you're going to have more freedom, but, you know, freedom obviously comes at a price with the denatured food and the pollution. So, yeah, that's, it's very yeah. interesting. So did you ever train clients? Were you ever, were you ever a personal trainer or you always just did everything more <laughs> online? That's I've been training clients since the time I was 14 years old. I mean, that's that's what I am. I'm a coach. Mm, I uh, 
that's that's how I I mean this that's what this is. This is like strength camp. The reason why I call it strength camp is because it's camp where you go to get stronger. And we train groups of athletes, we train groups of men. I've done boot camps before boot camps was even a thing. Actually I called it strength camp because I I mean there was no such thing as boot camps. That's why I came up with the term strength camp. Ours was more focused on on developing strength. And to this day, of course, I don't take as many clients as I used to, but I have client, I have people that come from all over the world. I had a, a couple of weeks ago, a guy came from Australia. We had a couple come from New, New Zealand that, to, to work with me. I mean, they're coming from all walks of life from all over the globe to come and train. That's awesome. That's cool. So yeah, I've seen some of your videos, uh, you know, where you're shooting at your, uh, at your place. Is that your facility? Mm hmm. Cool. Cool. What kind of strength training are you primarily doing in there? Is it you know all all various forms of strength training? You know traditional lifts, some of the so-called functional lifts. Well, strength camp came about mainly during the the era that I was participating and competing in professional strongman. So what makes what we do unique is this combination of of what is truly, I believe, functional exercise, which is picking up heavy odd objects, dragging, throwing pushing, pulling, and uh, we combine that with some powerlifting, bodybuilding, and structural integrity work. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a holistic approach to developing, the, the, you know, the fully self-actualized athlete. Yeah, it's really cool that I see that, you know, you, you really put a big focus on the nervous system, and, uh, and I like mm -hmm. that because I, I feel like that's a, it, it, it's a buzzword and it's coming up more and more, uh, which is, is just good. But, um, yeah, it's something that a lot of people neglect and, and don't think about is that, that sympathetic response and the parasympathetic response and having balance in your program and, you know, not, not just being, not just lifting heavy all the time and lifting like a me head all the time, but also, you know, not, not doing all the crazy BOSU circus acts either. You know, it's having, having balance in your program with different modalities. Yeah, everything has its time and place, and I, I believe that all exercise modalities have their purpose. I think what happens is we become, as with all industries, we become addicted to our own ideas. We become uh, zealots for a particular way. I mean, just look at the diet industry, and you've got vegetarians that you know think that if you eat meat, you're you're going to hell, or you're some sort of uh, you know you're, you're going to rock from the inside. Mm -hmm. and you've got paleo people who are like, if you ever eat brains, your you know your colon's going to fall out of your ass. So I mean, you, you, <laughs> everybody gets very religious about their ideas. When my, the, my approach is, I, I think they all serve value. That there's all value. There's value in everything. Don't be so uh, attached to it. Look objectively and ask yourself and ask your clients the most simple question of all, which is, how's that working out for you? I meet many people who think they're healthy because they're vegetarians and so forth, but their skin is gray, their breath stinks, their fingernails are crackling, and they're losing hair at the age of 30. It's like, well, apparently, you know, whatever you happen to think about your philosophy, that's great, but you're, you're drinking your own Kool-Aid. It's clearly not working for you. A lot, even like a lot of uh, athletes and, and you know, powerlifters, bodybuilders, and so forth. I, I was at a gym the other day, and a bodybuilder was there who had recognized me from YouTube, and he was a uh, he was a championship bodybuilder. He won many shows, and uh, he must have been about 39 years old. And he says, "Look, man, my body hurts so badly." He says, I have to, it takes me like 30 minutes to get out of bed in the morning. So, you know, so on and so forth. And, uh, and he's like, I've won bodybuilding shows, but my, my life is going to hell because I'm in pain all the time. You, you got to ask yourself, well, how's that working out for you? You know, you might look really damn good, but if you, if you're sick, sad, depressed, injured and, and screwed up at the core, then you might want to take a, a step back and look at the bigger picture. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. You know, I'm doing my precision nutrition certification right now. And, and the one thing I really like about John Berardi's stuff is that, you know, he, he really emphasizes kind of that, that uh, system of checks and balances with his, you know, assessment and follow up. He's like, you know, if you're not seeing progress, you got to make you got to change something. You know, otherwise, right. it's like, why would you keep doing the same thing if you're not seeing the results you're looking for? Right. So I, I agree. I like that. How many days a week do you work out? Three to five, you know, it just depends. Nice. Yeah. 
And, and you said you're mainly doing some of the kind of the strongman heavy lifts. Well, you know, again, it's it's a full balance because yesterday we we took the jerk blocks outside and and push pressed 315 over our heads. But then this morning I spent a good 90 minutes to two hours just stretching, stretching and doing core work, meaning like on the floor and uh, and walking. So, you know, it, it's you got to take a yin yang approach. If you're all fire, you're going to burn yourself out. If you're all water, you're just going to be a weak little bastard. So you, you sort of have to do a little bit of both. You know, you've got people who do yoga only, and it's like, yeah, that's cool that you do yoga, but you can't even, like, you, you're, you're tripping over your feet as you walk up the stairs because you have no functional strength. Everything that you're doing is about how you can open up your your body. And then you got people that are so rigid and stiff because of all the years of bodybuilding with high volume and, and moderate intensities that they can't get out of bed because their back hurts. Take a balanced approach. Mm-hmm. Don't don't fall in love with either end of the spectrum. Recognize you need a little bit of both, and give both the respect that they're due. Yeah, one thing that's really interesting. I have a I have a guy who works for me who's a muscle activation techniques guy, and he's really extreme on the other end when it comes to like foam rolling and stretching. He's really against it. He's always saying, "No, you should never you should never foam roll. There's no point to stretch." He said it only treats symptoms, you know, it doesn't help activate the muscle, build the motor patterns, etc. You know, what, what do you think about that? How do you, first of all, if you're going to activate motor patterns, you need to be able to have the, the joint integrity and freedom to be able to activate sound, sound motor patterns. Mm-hmm. If you have muscular imbalance, if you've got a muscle that's, uh, that, that is, you've got synergistic dominance in your hip flexor as it relates to your, your deep abdominal wall, your transversus abdominis, your upper hamstrings, then you're, you're never going to do a functional pattern. You're never going to have the ability to move freely and to your fullest capacity if you don't stretch that freaking muscle. I don't care what you say. Of course, strengthening is important. You'd have to strengthen your, your, your transversus abdominis, your upper hamstrings. But if you don't take the time to open up the rigidity and the tension that's in the hip flexor, then you're wasting your time. That's like uh, that's like if you took a took a race car and the wheels weren't aligned, you needed a, an alignment, but you said to yourself, "Well, you know, there's this fancy cone course. So I'm just going to keep. I'm going to drive this car around the fancy cone course because it's functional. I'm using the car, right? And somehow, magically, the wheels are going to make itself back aligned. You know, you actually have to get down there and you have to realign the the, the wheel, mm-hmm. you understand? So yeah. You've got to take time for corrective stretching. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully, uh, I fully believe in balance. I'm not really an extremist, really in anything in life. So, for me, I, I look for, uh, you know, for moderation and everything. I, I think that, you know, you look at CrossFitters. I think that they're always seem to be foam rolling and theracaning and cupping or whatever it may be because. I feel like they're they're always on the extreme end of the spectrum, but you know, I'm kind of with you. I kind of like to be in the middle. I like to I like to do a little bit of everything that helps um, you know achieve that holistic health and wellness. It's a strange place to be, but I think that's where humanity is going because we've seen how rigid thought, very religious dogma about any particular idea creates creates thinking that is that that's imprisoned, and it creates attitudes that are that are that are prejudiced, that are bigoted, that are that are non cohesive with what we all are, which is which is a unified field of understanding and information. If I'm going to say, yes, I've got it, this is the one and only, and then make everybody else and their ideas uh, a demon because of it, or someone else who doesn't do what I do or understand what I'm doing or is just not they're not ready for it, you know, I might not be ready for Theracanes then I'm creating separation. I'm creating strife. I'm creating problems through, through limited communication between those who might actually have something that's valuable to me. And by closing people off, perhaps the value that you could offer, you never get an opportunity to share because you're so dogmatic about yours. Be open, share, participate. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it seems like uh, extreme seems to sell in America, and it seems to be a, a good marketing ploy for 
for things like CrossFit and some other other um, fad diets and whatnot because people are always looking for that silver bullet. So I, I think that's probably why they buy into it so easy. What I think it is, I think it's a human being thing. And I think human beings have a tendency to not want to take responsibility for the things in their lives. They want to be able to point to a book that told them, well, you know, I, I read this paleo book and the paleo book said such and such. And because the author of the book has certain letters next to his name, he must know what he's talking about. And I'm going to invest all of my time and energy into participating in the activities described in this book. And because it's taken so much of my time and energy to learn this particular thing and to practice this particular thing, I have to uphold these ideals because I'm personally identified with it. And if I have, if I remove my personal identification from these ideas and this particular book, then I am vulnerable to being questioned. I'm vulnerable to attack. I'm vulnerable to my ideas, perhaps moving somewhere else because there might be another idea that seduces me and I decide to explore that. So what I've got to do is I've got to become a prisoner of this one particular idea. And in that I am safe. Because within that prison structure, you have the safety of the multitude. All the other paleo people are here. All the other uh, functional exercise people are here. All of the other, whatever you want to call it, because we've got a lot of these different ideas that we tend to, to hold holy. I am mm -hmm. safe because of them and because of this and because of the book. Yeah. You see? Yeah, no, that, that's true. Let go, let go, let, let it go and see what the world has to offer instead of you grasping so tightly to your dogma. Yeah, no, it's true. It seems like so many people just get caught up in the chaos of life that they don't take that step back to ask the right questions. And, uh, and yeah, like you said, they don't, they don't accept responsibility over their own actions and over their own life. So they like to pass the buck on to something else. You know what happens when you take responsibility, though, too? This is very scary because we've been conditioned out of this in our society. You might be wrong and yeah. you might make a mistake. And that's very scary to most people. They're not willing to say things, try things, do things, explore things because it might turn out not to be right. And they might end up hurting themselves. No, I don't want to say hurt themselves. What was the other thing I said? You might be wrong and it might not work. That's a better way to look at it. Nobody wants to hurt themselves. But the whole idea is that you've got to build the courage to be able to explore. Yeah. Everybody's so they're, they're, they're so attached to their safety and security that they have squashed any courage that the human being could possibly cultivate in order to venture off into new uncharted territories that is the essence of human evolution. Go play with ideas. Go figure out something new. Go take two ideas that are seemingly like dichotomies and bring them together and see what happens. Say something that no one else has ever said simply because you are interested in this idea. Just be willing to put yourself out there to be wrong and to be challenged. Yeah, no, I agree. So, um, and to fail, to get hurt, to, to fail. That's really the word I was looking for. You might fail. So yeah. what though? That's right. Yeah. People are really, really risk averse because of failure that, that, uh, that pain avoidance. Right. Uh, have you had mentors over the years? Oh, yeah, tremendous. I mean, it, absolutely. Um, I tend to think that everybody in our lives are mentors of sorts. You know, they all show us different things. I once heard that uh, everyone in your life, and I think it goes far beyond what I'm about to share, but everyone in your life is either a mirror an angel or a crystal ball. And, uh, and if you come across someone and, you know, you, oftentimes we either, the vibration is so strong between you and someone else that you're repelled by each other or you're really drawn to each other. And I think those are the two types of people you should pay the most attention to. People who really like, if you ever watch them or hear them speak or, or come across them, you're like, you're just totally turned off and you just, you want to, push them away and you're, you're, you're angered by them. You can't stand being around them or, or they really get under your skin. 
that take notice because uh, that, that person might be a mentor. That person might be teaching you something, telling you something about yourself. And of course, those it's very easy to embrace those that come to us and uh, that vibe very easily and very harmoniously right away. So you know, we tend to push away one type of physiological response, which is uh, discomfort, and notice that the discomfort is yours, and draw close to those that bring us pleasure. But someone who brings Feelings of discomfort, oftentimes, in my experience and in, in coaching people, is that guy happens to be a mirror. There's, you're seeing a part of yourself in that dude that you just don't like or are willing to accept. And that person, in many ways, is a mentor. Because it's like, what can you learn now from your experience with this mirror? I hate that guy. I can't stand him. He's an asshole. He's an idiot. He's a fool. Ah, let's explore that a little bit. What are you learning about yourself right now? And most people aren't willing to look at themselves that objectively, so they never will learn anything. But what I'm inviting you to do is to, to be objective for a moment. Step back for a moment. In the same way that we were talking about all of the, the dogmatic ideas with regard to fitness and, and, and life. Then there are those people who are your crystal balls. And I think we're attracted to those type of people because they kind of elude to the type of future that we're creating for ourselves. We tend to be attracted to those who... Um, those who exude what we would like to be, what we want to become. I think Brian Tracy once said something to the effect of, uh, you become who you most secretly admire. And oftentimes there are people, you look at them and you're like, you know, that, there's something there that is indicative of my future. And then there are angels. And these are people who, who purely just drop in and deliver a blessing and disappear. And, I, and I've had many of those also. So, you know, when it comes to mentors, it's just a matter of keeping your eyes open and recognizing the opportunities available to you with all communication with all people. Who have been some of your most influential mentors, would you say? Very first mentor in this way that most will probably be most fascinating to, to for this interview is my uncle. Because uh, an interesting thing I once read about how um, many of our traditional societies where they lived as tribes as opposed to how we do the, 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 um, the family today. You know, most families today is it's father, father, mother, and then immediate family. That's the core of, of what we is the contemporary family. But it wasn't always that way. You know, there if you just look at the native Americans and how they structure their tribes uh, and the, and, and most traditional societies, I'm sure at some point, even European, but obviously African and Aboriginal, they were, they lived in tribes. And uh, what the book that I was reading described how it was very advantageous to the development of the young man to have his uncle be his main, um, masculine mentor um, to, to, as opposed to the father because the fa fathers typically have a, a sense of personal identification with the success or, or, or how the boy becomes, comes out. So their interaction is tainted because the boy is like a reflection of me and, and I want to portray a particular ideal through this child and you sort of you screw the kid up because you're not allowing that child to be all who he is because you're you're too subjective about the relationship you're too attached to what's going on where an uncle and usually it was the it was the mother's brother was the primary caretaker in this particular tribe that i was studying about um he loves the child because it's his nephew it's his my my, my sister's son but because there's no personal identification with um, the child being a represent representative of my own masculinity, he's more objective about the choices that he makes, the advice that he gives, and the, where, the way he cares and, and, and takes care of the kid. And I can see that in my own experience with my father and my uncle. I was lucky enough to have my uncle come live with us, with my mother's brother, and he, unlike my father, who, as fathers are, my son was just here and I had to scold him because he did something not too cool to another <laughs> child in school today. 
but he he was a friend and he was a and he was someone to aspire to that lived in my own home and he was a grown man you know he must have been about 25 when I was born so uh, I saw him as like the the coolest thing to look up to and to aspire to and to become and he happened to be a really good mentor in that way now he has his own son today and uh i'm sure if i have a conversation with his son <laughs> when when he's 30 years old and i tell him about uncle my uncle's name is uncle elroy and uh and his son we'll probably have two totally different experiences because he was your dad and well of course that that creates a totally different circumstances circumstance as opposed to me well he's my uncle you know, and uh, and that allows the uncle, the, the mother's brother, to be a tremendous resource and mentor in the lives of myself and, and many young men I'd, I'd imagine throughout history. That's awesome. Uh, it, I, I like your uh, your profound, uh, pr- you know, thought provoking ideas, and and uh, it, it seems like you're a, you're definitely a thinker. I, I think you probably spent a lot of time just really um, thinking about all these different things. So it's um, Really, really cool perspectives because you know there's so many social norms and so many things that people are just don't they don't question they don't think about these things and so it's really cool to bring these things to light. Thanks. Yeah, I I, I just enjoy doing that. I don't know. It's fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what would you say your probably your favorite health website or blog is besides your own? Oh. Yeah, I, I don't say this out of out of arrogance. I just I don't I don't read any blogs or or websites in a great degree. Now I, I have a, a pretty big library. I read lots of books. I mean, I'm I'm going through a stack right now of books that uh that all nice. relate to a particular <laughs> thing that I'm considering. But that's what my house and that's what my office, that's what my gym looks like. So I get my, most of my information from from books. I just happen to enjoy books. And I also have been listening to a lot of audio books lately, which is, uh, which has been tremendous, uh, a time saver and stuff. So whenever I train, I usually listen to audio books. Nice. That's good. It's really efficient. Yeah. You're just a wealth of knowledge. I like that. I like that, uh, constant, uh, hunger for knowledge. Uh, that's what this, um, that's what it's really all about, you know, to really uh, expand and, and augment your, uh, just your frame of reference. Um, let's see, uh, what is your favorite book? I always reference Ralph Waldo Emerson, the essential writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson. I just feel a kindred, like he's a kindred spirit. He was a poet. He was a writer. I recently read his biography and, uh, and I, I can say safely that reading his book, his books, his, his essays really have, smooth many transitions in my life and, and has given me perspective where I otherwise might have, um, like most of us do, go through bouts of anxiety, depression, and confusion. His words have always given me courage. Nice, nice. So what does a typical day for you look like in terms of uh, nutrition and sleep and and so forth, you know, do you, do you, do you prepare your meals every day or is that something you do weekly? Well, what I do is my typical day is I wake up in the morning, I go for a walk on an empty stomach and, uh, and I, I listen to my audiobooks. I get back and I start preparing breakfast for my children. I, I take fish oil first thing on the, when I walk in. So I'll take like 17 fish oil pills and some amino acids cause I usually fast during the day. I, most of what I do is intermittent fasting during the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've been doing what, what, what has been labeled or I, I tend to call micro fasting. That means bringing in some micronutrients throughout the day. So I'll take fish oil, I'll take amino acids, I'll take some green supplements and some fiber throughout the day. And then once dinner comes about, my wife is a, is a great cook. So she typically prepares either some beef or some chicken or some salmon, uh, usually with vegetables that are cruciferous, mostly broccoli and cauliflower and uh, Brussels sprouts and some leafy greens sometimes. And, uh, and that's five days a week. On the weekend, it's pretty much 
I like, I'll eat whatever. It's kind of, my kids are home. I go to my mother's house this week. I had fried chicken and, uh, and brown rice and, uh, carrot cake and <laughs> just <laughs> a weekend comes and that's when I just say, well, that's it. I'm eating whatever I want to. So, um, that's, that's the typical week for me. Nice. <laughs> that's good. You know, I've, I've been reading... book, okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, ha- you have to do that. And I've actually, you know, read a lot of good things about, you know, having that style of a diet. It's actually good for the metabolism and helps, helps, uh, really just, you know, with not only muscle gain, but it can also help with fat loss as well. I've been mm-hmm. really into the, you know, the bulletproof style, you know, Dave Asprey's, uh, bulletproof intermittent fasting. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I, that's a pretty cool one to try too. It's it's uh, mainly you know you drink his coffee in the morning with uh, the MCT fats, you know the short chain fatty acids, and that's that his whole concept behind that is that you're tricking the body into thinking that it hasn't broken the fast, so you're still getting some macronutrients and micronutrients in, but your body's still kind of in that fat burning, you know, cat- catabolic uh, mode. Yeah, that's basically what it is. It's very similar to that approach, and I've I've tried some of his coffee before too. The uh, I was getting way too many calories. I maybe yeah. I was putting too much <laughs> coconut oil in there, so I started getting chubby. So I was like, "All right, I got to cut that." But uh, but it's still very similar. Nice, <laughs> cool. <laughs> what, what, what? Which of your current habits would you say are the most fundamental for your health? Meditation. Meditation is at the top of the list for me. If I if I go too long without meditating, I begin to my Everything internally and externally begins to fall apart, and I, I start making poor decisions. And I have to meditate. It's not a matter of oh, I'm so cool because I meditate, and I think everybody should meditate. No, that's not it. It's like it's like Prozac to me. It's like I don't. I'm a mess, so I just have to do it. And I've resisted that idea because it you know it takes time and it takes effort. So meditation's at the top of that list, and I don't even consider it a a, a second one because I believe that the the body is the mind and exercise is a form of meditation in many ways to me. So meditation and movement are are paramount in my, in my life and, and, and the habits that until the day I die, I'll have to engage in. Nice. You know, you know, meditation, I hear about a lot. It's a very pervasive term with a lot of obscurity around it because a lot of people don't really know exactly, you know, how do they get into it? What does it entail? You know, what, what does it mean to you? What, what does meditation look like? Like, how much time do you spend, and how do you get into it? Meditation to me is anything that reduces the stronghold of the ego on your character, both bodily and psychologically. And it, 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 meditation is a process by which we can allow, let it go, at least for a period of time. And we begin to, my experience is, you begin to not only have the meditation experience while you're exercising, while you're meditating, while you're shutting off your brain, while you're reducing the muscular tension in your body that's associated with the ego's grip on your muscular system, but over time, it then becomes a walking awareness. The more uh, the more I'm meditating, the more frequently I'm meditating, the more it seems as if my life is a meditation. So if instead of it being that one hour in the 24 hours, it starts to almost feel as if when I'm talking to someone, when I'm writing, when I'm with my children, when I'm driving, it almost seems like the meditation begins to expand and take over I don't take over is the wrong word. Uh, relax and center and ground the rest of my life, so that the monkey mind, the the spinning chatter within the head that that often happens at an unconscious level, doesn't get in the way of what my true intention is. You see. Nice. So, however you can get that to happen, I think you. you you explore it and you allow yourself to, to develop to develop it that way. For me, it's I, I need a combination of both sitting meditation and I use binaural beats that I listen to and I've been doing this for 10 years. 
And I, and I use that to keep my mind, my head brain, really. Because when I say mind, I really I believe that the mind is, is, uh, is ever present throughout our entire body. But keep the head brain calm, grounded, focused. But then I also need forms of physical exercise like yoga and bioenergetics that causes the muscular tension to soften. And, uh, and if I'm doing one without the other or if I – it's just they have to be combined for me to be at my best. That's good. I like that. You know, I, I, like, I like the detail you put into that because I think there is for a lot of people, there's just so much obscurity around it. And, and um, yeah, it's just so much confusion around what it is. People think of yoga or something when they think of meditation. And, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't have to be that complicated. But I do feel like it's a fundamental factor for especially a lot of my clients that have a hard time losing weight. You know, if I found that just getting them to a higher level of consciousness through meditation on a regular basis does really help because then you become more aware and in tune with your mind and your body and, you know, your perspectives and all those things. They, they all start connecting. So that's cool. Yeah, you that. make better choices. I mean, that, it boils down to that. I mean, we, people get scared when you start talking about the consciousness and the mind and vibration and shit like that. They, you know, they get all nervous and superstitious. You don't even have to say that. You, you can simply put it as, it's a practice by which you get out of your own way. And you get in your own way by mind chatter. How many people can't even fucking sleep at night? They go to, they lay down in their bed with their eyes open because of the, all the chatter. They can't be by themselves because they, they're, they're, they'll crack up because there's so much mind chatter. There's too much going on here. And that's you getting in your own way. Meditation is call. I mean, I, we could give it a different name. You don't have to use meditation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like I said, people get they get all weirded out when you say that. It's just a practice by which you get out of your own way to allow yourself to be relaxed and focused enough in the moment to make better decisions. Nice. I like that. That's a that's a good definition. Really clear. So, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of your program, the strength camp, and the blog, and all the stuff you're working on, what what does the future look like for you? What, what are you looking to do ten years from now? Where do you want to be? Oh, I can't see that far in the, into the future. <laughs> but right now, what's on my what's on my to do list is uh, is to continue doing what I'm doing with the videos at, at a bigger and a better. Uh, and more pro prolific rate, you know, it's, I, I really enjoy it. And I've got a great team that supports our ability to crank out a lot of videos as long as I'm on, on point. And, um, and then taking strength camp, the actual physical location and, and training service and expanding it. That's probably going to be the project for the next, you know, 24, 24 months to five years, it's going to be expanding strength camp, moving to a bigger location and uh, serving more people. I, I want it to be, for lack of better terms, a mecca of sorts for strength training, bodybuilding, powerlifting uh, and sports performance. So uh, and I, I think at this point, the value and the influence is there to, to begin working on a project that big. Nice. No, I, I think that's a really good niche, and I think that um, that that sounds like a really good idea and a successful program. So that, that's definitely a good idea. Yeah, man. So, what tip would you you know leave uh, the viewers with? You know, what's what's kind of the final tip you think that is the kind of the salient point that everyone should really think about? Well, I, I would invite you to see the body as the mind the way I've described it before. Of course, there's a lot more to be discussed with regard to that because it's kind of, it sounds almost like it's a little crazy. But what I, what I would invite you to do is to treat your exercise programs, treat your body like it's a temple, treat your body like it's a temple, and treat your exercise routines and the, and, and the activities that you engage in, the foods that you put into your body and the way you treat your body through movement or lack thereof as not only a way to enhance your aesthetics, not only a way to increase your sports performance, but also as a means by which you become a stronger version of yourself. Self-actualization will come through the mind and, and the body is a part of the mind in that way. You, 
you've got to treat your body as if it's an integral part to your to your mental, spiritual, cognitive evolution. If yeah. you want to be smarter, then begin deep breathing. If you want to, if you if you want to uh, be more eloquent with women, begin walking in the morning. See your body as a part of your in your exercise routine as a part of the bigger picture for all of what you want to have happen in your life. That's good. I like that. So that kind of wraps it up for my questions. Uh, and do you have any questions for me? No, man. That was cool. Cool. All right, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, and I'll talk to you soon. You got it. Have a good one. All right. Bye.